Today we're going to primarily focus on the full suite of the Gradelink SIS student information system. The first half of the presentation we're going to take kind of a deep dive into some of the administrator focused tools, things like communications, online enrollment and admissions, finances, and student data management. And the back half, the last 30 minutes or so, we're going to focus more on tools that teachers are going to interact with. Uh, things, for example, like grade sheets, lesson plans, attendance, report cards, and transcripts. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and dive in right now and take a look at the Gradelink service software. Now, I'm logged in as a full administrator within Gradelink. And prior to actually beginning this webinar, it's probably important for us to talk about some of the different user groups within Gradelink and how we interact with them. For example, we have a full administrator, as I was discussing before, somebody who has complete access to the system. That'd be somebody like George Washington here, who can do everything in the system. He can make adjustments to settings, he can change user permissions, and he has basically access to every major page on Gradelink to be able to make changes. Below that, we would have something like Rachel Registrar, a limited administrator who we have a certain level of permission access to the system. For example, Rachel might be able to access things like communication tools, online enrollment and registration, and finances, but she might not necessarily need access to checking you know, children's grades or being able to run things like report cards or transcripts. Full admins are a preset group. Of course, they can do everything, whereas limited admins are customized on a user-by-user -user basis, so you're able to kind of have different types of accounts depending on the person. Below that would be a teacher account. That would be somebody like Joan of Arc here. Teachers, of course, have access to the classes that we put them in charge in, of, which we can see over on the right-hand side, as well as any of the students in those classes. But they can't access anything outside of that very small scope. And of course, we also have our end users. Those would be the parents and the students who are able to log in and kind of manage things like progress, uh, view their academics, their attendance, maybe run some other reports that we give them access to. But largely, the, their level of interaction with the system is just being able to kind of view things. So today, we're primarily going to focus on what the administrators will see. The back half will concentrate a little bit more on what the teachers will interact with, but from the perspective of kind of the administrator login. And the very first thing that I do want to be able to focus on here is the Communicate tab up in the top left, because it is the first thing that you'll see when you log into Gradelink as an admin level user. Now you can see here we actually default to what's called the Gradelink News page, which is kind of an opportunity for us here at Gradelink to let you guys know what's going on over here. We might post updates as far as new features that we're going to be releasing. It could be a blog post that we've re recently uh, read or maybe a promotion that we're running right now or just other pieces of news that we want to share with you. And similarly, we want you guys to be able to offer this same level of communication to your families that you're working with. So to that end, we've created the school news section. This is a chance for you to actually use this as more of like a newsletter or blog format to post updates as to what's going on at your organization. These could be pictures and videos. It could be resources like hyperlinks to other websites or maybe attachments that you'd like them to download. But it's a good opportunity for you to be able to tell your families what's going on at the school. If it's turned on in the top left up here, it is the default page that a parent or student would be able to see when they first log in. So it'll be right in their face. You can communicate anything you need to. And because it's a newsletter format, you can have multiple posts that you can actually interact with. You can see up here, for example, that I have the newsletter for January 2020. I also have one called Get Ready for a New Semester that I have active that parents can actually toggle between at any time. Making adjustments to this is fairly easy. You click the Edit button in the top right, and it almost looks like I'm kind of crafting a Word document, for example. A lot of the tools that you'll see are fairly comparable. You can also publish and unpublish certain posts that you've already made. So if you've made a post, you can actually go ahead and not have to worry about recreating that post next year. You can just unpublish it, make any changes to it, and reuse it again year after year if you need to. Teacher pages largely follow the same concept here, but made by teachers, right? Similar kind of conceptually speaking in terms of how people interact with it, but now we're talking about our teachers interacting with this to post information to a much smaller group. So whereas school news can be seen by everybody, teacher pages can only be seen by the rosters of those classes that the teachers are in charge of. 
For our younger grades, you can create just a single page, maybe called like the announcements page, for example, where you paste all of your updates regarded to every single subject that you teach in the classroom. And for our upper grade levels, where they have different groups of students that they're working with, maybe on a periodic basis, we actually give them the ability to create different class pages based on the subject, which you can see on the left-hand side here. Again, the functionality is exactly the same, so I don't want to get into what it looks like to edit these or make changes to them, but keep in mind it's not something that teachers have to utilize. It's just an extra tool for those who want to have that piece of communication. There's a question in the chat asking, does GradeLink have an app? The answer is yes. There is a mobile app for parents and students to be able to download completely for free. GradeLink is also mobile friendly, so if you don't want to download the app but still want to access GradeLink on the go, you can just pull up your mobile browser like Chrome or Safari, log in through there, and do everything that you would normally be able to do on a desktop as well. The other thing that we want to talk about when we discuss communication is a little bit more direct. Right. Thus far, we've kind of relied on parents maybe logging into the system to view information, like on the school news or teacher pages. But in some cases, we really want to reach out to the parent directly and let them know what's going on at the school or in the classroom. And to that end, GradeLink offers SmartSend Pro. As a part of the basic service, you inherently have access to the email tool within GradeLink, which is going to allow you to send out emails to different groups of families or staff that you're working with. Administration has access to emailing everybody in the database whether it's students, parents, or their staff. Whereas teachers have access to reaching out to the family specifically that they're working with. Now, if you've used an email tool before, and I'm guessing many of you probably have sent an email in your life, this is probably going to feel fairly comparable. You can do your own custom signature, as you can see here, add attachments, which you can see at the bottom of the page here, and save things as drafts or view a history of what's been sent out already. If you want to send a message, you can set it in real time or schedule it to go out later by clicking the Schedule button, which allows you to select a customized date and time that the message will go out. Sending to different individuals is fairly easy. At the top of the page, we have a group selector, as well as a simple entry bar here where you can plug in any name or email address that you'd like to reach out to. The group selector comes with certain predefined groups that you can reach out to very easily. For example, all active staff, all active parents, all alumni, or specific grade levels or classes. Or you can actually create your own customized groups on a user-by-user -user basis. This is done by clicking the Groups button in the top right and clicking Add New Group, which will allow you to customize your parameters based on things like grade level, division, class, or custom tags that you've created and assigned to your students. I've got a few here like gymnastics team, robotics fan, international student, and so on. These are smart groups, so to speak. So as long as the student meets the parameters to be in this group, they will automatically be filtered into it, meaning you only have to set the group up one time, and GradeLink will add and remove students and families to and from that group as long as they meet the parameters. So for example, if I wanted to make a group for all of my fifth grade students who have let's say an allergy to peanuts, they will only stay in that group for as long as they're fifth graders or for as long as they're allergic to peanuts or that we have them marked as allergic to peanuts within the system. So next year when they move into the sixth grade, they'll automatically be taken out of that group and any fourth grader who is now a fifth grader and is marked as allergic to peanuts will be put into that group automatically. We also offer text and voice messaging as a premium service. All this, the uh, customizable features that I've talked about, like the scheduling feature and the custom groups, do carry over here. But keep in mind that as far as text and voice messaging are concerned, it is something that is available to administration only. The intent is not to allow your teachers to come in here and send out text or voice messages related to their specific classrooms. It's more for mass communication, emergency services, things of that nature. Texting is fairly straightforward. You type in your message here, you send it out to whoever you'd like to send it out to, whenever you'd like to send it out to. Voice messaging is a little bit different here. When we talk about sending out a voice recording within GradeLink, it's not a robocall. We're not typing in a message and having a computer read it back when it gets blasted out. We're actually gonna type in our 10-digit phone number here, and in doing so, our phone will ring. We'll pick it up like we would and record a message as if we were leaving a message for a friend on their voicemail. When we hang up, the message shows up in GradeLink, and again, just like email or text, we're able to then send it out to whoever we'd like to and determine when it goes out. The number does get masked when it gets sent out. So for those of you who frequently have to deal with, let's say, uh, inclement weather situations, 
right? Obviously, the Midwest and the East right now are having a lot of snow issues. And you can't make it into the school to actually record a message on your school phone number, that's okay. If you plug in your cell phone or phone, home phone number, that number will get masked. You don't have to worry about the school body actually receiving that personal information. The number does get masked to the school line when it actually gets blasted out from the system. Pivoting away from that, we're actually going to shift gears here a little bit and jump down a few notches on the left-hand side to click on Enroll Me, which is Gradelink's service for handling applications and re-enrollment documentation. As this loads in, on the left-hand side, we see a few different entries here, which would actually be all of the applications and re-enrollment applications that have actually been submitted as a part of this particular school year, for the upcoming school year, rather. If I click on one, I load into what's called the workflow page, which allows me to see any notes that have been left on this application, the status update history, and whether or not families have made any payments as a part of this application, whether it's a registration fee, an application fee, or so on. We'll talk a little bit more about that financial aspect as we kind of progress through the demonstration. Enrollment allows us to actually build you completely customized forms. We start from the ground up with each school to build whatever you need us to build. So of course, there are pieces of information that every single school is going to want to collect. You'll want to know the student's name, birthday, gender, ethnicity, uh, maybe some contact information, medical data, things of that nature. But if you have custom forms, like waivers that you ask them to fill out, or just documentation that you need to collect from them in the forms of maybe immunization records, uh, you know, just other medical information, maybe governmental IDs like a birth certificate or a uh, you know, uh, driver's license or something of that nature, you can go ahead and collect it through here as well. We do build the forms from the ground up from scratch for each organization, so every form can be unique. Forms can also vary depending on differing things within the application itself. For example, if you'd like to have different uh, forms filled out for your first-time applicants versus your re-enrolling families, we can accommodate that. Or if you have different forms based on things like grade level, we can also work with you to create what's called dynamic forms, meaning that younger grade levels, for example, if they have to fill out something different than upper grade levels, we can accommodate that. Now, for your returning students, families who are coming back year after year and have been with you for X amount of time, their data is already saved in the system. And we'll take a look at this in a little bit when we look at the Students tab up in the top left. But because their data is already in the system, it means that they don't actually have to go through and fill everything out year after year. Things like the student's contact, demographic, and medical information is already stored within Gradelink, meaning that when they go in to re-enroll, when you enable the button for them, when they log in, all of their data is already there. It'll fill out for them automatically. They just have to make sure that everything is correct and up to date, and they can go through the re-enrollment application in just a handful of minutes. If you're a new applicant, of course, you're not in Gradelink quite yet. We do give you a link that you can go ahead and either email out if you want a private application, or if you want a public one, we give you the ability to embed it directly onto your website. New applicants will sign up with a temporary username and password, the username being their email address and the password being whatever they'd like it to be. Now, this doesn't necessarily become their Gradelink username and password. It's just for them to manage their application so that they don't have to do it all in one sitting. But they'll be able to go through the entire application and eventually submit it online as well. And whether they're a first-time applicant or a re-enrolling student, you'll notice that their information appears in the left-hand side for you to manage. Now, I should stress, this information shows up in here as soon as they start the application, not when they submit it. Right? So what I mean by that is if somebody goes onto your website and says, you know what, this looks like a great school, I've done my research, I'm going to go ahead and apply, and they get through maybe just page one, they fill out basic student information, and then they realize that they're late for work or they were going to go to an event or something, and they put the application on pause and say, I'm going to come back to this when I get the chance. And then that chance never comes. Maybe they completely forget about it, it slips their mind, and you notice in here that that application has just sat for weeks you will have at least that first page of information that they, they filled out. So you don't have to wait for them to actually click Submit at the end of the application in order to start tracking some of the data. So in that sense, you never really lose a lead, right? As soon as somebody says, yes, I'm interested, and they put in even just one field, they just put in their student's name, for example, you have at least that information. Gradelink can send you alerts based on form statuses. So in the top left, you'll notice that this form status is in process. But we have a drop-down menu with different options for you to go ahead and kind of toggle through depending on where the application is in the enrollment process. 
It's really common for administration to be able to want to receive alerts every time somebody submits an application, but some also want to be able to receive ones when somebody starts an application, uh, maybe when one is approved versus rejected or not approved. If somebody cancels an application, you can choose to be notified for any and all of those. And that's on a user-by-user -user basis. So if certain users want to receive more alerts than others, they can certainly do so. These form statuses can also send out automated email triggers to the applicants themselves. So again, a really common one is at the end of the application, once they've actually submitted it, you might have an email that goes out thanking them for their submission and letting them know what the next steps will be moving forward. Similarly, you might have one for pending, for example, where if they forgot to submit maybe a payment or if they haven't given you some documentation that you needed, you switch it over to pending, and again, a different email template that you've written out goes out to them, letting them know so that you don't have to be the one to type up an email manually or call them or anything like that. We can also go ahead and build you what's called enrollment contracts. If you're in need of physical forms that take the information from the online forms and print it or put it into a printable or PDF-able contract, we can do that as well. This doesn't necessarily need to pull all of the information from the online forms that we saw, but it can pull some of it at the very least. It'll take some of this information, put it in here, and then again, if you need it for auditing purposes, for example, you can go ahead and put it in here. Now, applications in GradeLink store forever. When we actually transfer student data into the student section, we are not doing a cut and paste, we're doing a copy and paste. So if you ever need to go back and run statistics on a particular enrollment year to see how many applications you got, how many people you accepted versus rejected based on things like grade level or just overall, you are able to actually go back and view all of those enrollment contracts and run reports on them years after the fact. For schools that have been using us for five, six, seven, ten years and have been using Enroll Me for as long, they do have all of those enrollment contracts saved in the system as well. On that note, let's switch over to the student section because ultimately we're going to import the data from Enroll Me into the students section here. This is where we get to talk about everybody's favorite thing, which is student data management. Everybody loves talking about entering in phone numbers and allergies and things of that nature here. And this is where we're going to be able to do that. So when we click on a particular page, we can learn a little bit more about the student. This is Susan B. Anthony. You can see based on her picture on the right-hand side, it's not to be confused with the famous Susan B. Anthony. This is an opportunity for us to enter in basic information or at least just track basic information on our students. Like I said, if you're using Enroll Me, this information will automatically pull for you based on the information that the parents have input as a part of the application. But we're able to see things like uh, demographic data, birthday, gender, ethnicity, maybe start date when their intended date of graduation is. There's a picture on the right-hand side, and below that would be the classes that the student is in and their grades currently. And we can also see things like emergency contacts or notes that we've put in. A powerful tool on this page would be the tag section. We discussed tags a little bit earlier when we were taking a look at the communication tool, and we were customizing those groups, as we talked about before. When customizing communication groups, you are able to pull from existing tags that you've created. So if you actually have a tag in the system, it could be a tag that you have as a drop-down tag, ones that you use fairly often, basically, or it could be some random tag that isn't in here that you don't use all that often. For example, if I wanted to type in anything, I could do so. I probably would never run a tag off of this, but if I needed to. So tags are a powerful tool not only for those communication groups, but also for reporting purposes. I can run a report that looks at those tags. I could say, for example, look at every female eighth grader who is tagged with Girl Scouts. Right? Pull that up very quickly if I need to. Other pieces of information are stored in different sub-tabs at the top of the page. Most of these are probably fairly straightforward, so you can imagine what contacts, addresses, login info, notes, and so on would be. The two that I want to focus on are documents and files, because oftentimes they sound fairly identical to one another. Files are probably what you're thinking of when you hear files or documents. And this is a chance for you to actually go into the student's profile and upload a document from your computer into the cloud. So it's saved and associated to that student. These could be things like birth certificates or immunization records, like what I have here, or just any other documentation that you have. Maybe a report card or a transcript from another school that they transferred from. Maybe something that you had them upload during the enrollment process. There is an enrollment file section down here where files that the applicant has actually uploaded as a part of their registration or application online from Enroll Me that we just saw will carry over into their student profile here automatically. 
meaning you don't need to go into their application and download a copy and then re-upload it. It'll just transfer for you. Documents are a little bit different, right? Documents are kind of more like miscellaneous information that we would still want to be able to track, but that there's no good home for otherwise on the main page. So these are things like religious information, uh, maybe government-issued IDs. So if you wanted to track an encrypted social security number, you could do that. If you want to track things like language proficiency, like what they speak at home or how well they speak English. If you have carpool or busing information, like specific groups or routes that you want to track and run reports on, you can do that as well. Financial assistance codes. If you have financial assistance programs like free or reduced lunch, you can track that as well. So there's a lot of different things that go into this document section. But again, it's largely information that doesn't fit elsewhere, that we still want to have to be able to track and run reports on. There's some other notable ones at the top of the page. Things like counseling and medical are pretty big. Counseling, for example, allows you to keep track of different behavioral events that have occurred, positive or negative, related to the student. Now, obviously, when we refer to it internally, we call it incidents. It is largely intended to be able to keep track of negative occurrences, things where a child does something that warrants some sort of follow-up action that's usually fairly negative, whether it is a demerit, a detention, a suspension, and so on. Both teachers and admins can fill this out. If a teacher fills it out, it can send a notification to the administration letting them know. You can also share some of this information with parents when they log in, and parents can even receive alerts as well. But you can determine what they can see here. By default, they're able to see the incident date, location, incident type, the description of the incident, and any follow-up information. We also have the medical section up here where you can keep track of a variety of different things as well. You might keep track of just simple office visits or physical exams if you run those at the school regularly. Okay. You can track immunization records in the system. I would probably recommend just up to uploading the documentation if you have it, if you receive it from the applicants as a part of their application or if you've received it you know, some other way. That's probably easier than putting it in here, but if you manually want to track immunizations and run reports on it, you can certainly do so. There's a medication section where you can track any and all medications related to the student, what they're taking in the event of emergencies, what they're taking in, you know, permitted by the parent, and what they have to take on a regular basis if they have some sort of prescription recently. And finally, a medical history section which lists all health conditions, both past and present, related to the student. These will cover everything from allergies to asthma to things like seizure disorder or heart conditions that they might have. Things like the medications and the medical history can be shared with the teachers that are working with those students. But keep in mind they're not able to make changes to it, and of course they're not able to see information outside of their students that they're working with. With all that being said, for the last few minutes here, we're going to pivot over to the financial section, which is the last major piece that we're going to take a look at as a part of the administrative side of things before we shift into more academic-oriented tools in the back half of the conversation here. When we talk about GradeLink's financial piece, it's important to understand that GradeLink's financial piece is an accounts receivables program, first and foremost. It gives you the opportunity to actually program in different fees and transactions related to family or student accounts and communicate that information not only internally to run reports, but also use it to communicate information to your families so that they understand how much they owe you. Right. So when we talk about this, we are able to plug in things that you would probably naturally assume you would want to track, tuition and registration, which you can see on here. But via my settings, I'm actually able to make adjustments to this to add in anything that I'd like to go ahead and track on here. If I click on Admin and look at my Fees and Types section, you'll be able to see that I've set up quite a few different things as far as lunch, aftercare, registration, and a few different types of tuition. If you wanted to, you could also plug in things like yearbooks, spirit wear, field trips, and anything else that you can possibly come up with. These are broken up into kind of broad categories like charges, payments, and credit memos, which would be things like discounts or scholarships or grants, things like that. So you can go ahead and put that information in. That information will, of course, then land on the student or family ledger, which allows you to run reports to see who's paid what, 
who hasn't paid you in X amount of days, weeks, or months. Or, of course, communicate that information to the family so that when they log in, they can click on a billing button and view their monthly invoices or statements. These statements can be posted on a year-to-date basis, a month-to-month -month basis, and you can go ahead and share current activity, which would show things that are fairly recent, like in the last 30 days or so. Parents can click on any of these blue underlined options on the left to download it, which will give them a more specific breakdown of when charges were incurred on their account and what the specific details of those charges were. You can also allow parents to make payments online if you're interested in it. This will allow parents to actually go online and submit payments either via credit card or via ACH. These could be one-off payments or they can set up an automatic recurring withdrawal plan basically telling the system to take money out of their account on a regular basis. As you probably have noticed through here, whether they're setting up an auto pay plan or if they're doing a one-off payment, they have no other page that they're going to. Gradelink is fully integrated with our merchant vendor partner, meaning that the users don't actually need a separate username and password. They actually don't ever see the name of the company that we work with that's actually processing the payments behind the scenes. That name is PaySimple. They're the financial company that we work with that actually handles the process of collecting the fees, processing them, and eventually depositing them into the school's bank account. But again, the name PaySimple never shows up on here. The only people who would know that name are the internal administration. Outside of that, again, a lot of the financial piece is mostly about reporting, running different things like aging reports to see who hasn't paid you in a while, running a billing transactions report to see how much money you've brought in a particular category over a particular period of time, and other reports of that nature. Most of this data can be easily exported into an Excel, PDF, or in some cases even a Word doc format. So if you need to get it out of the system for whatever reason, that's not going to be an issue. There's a couple of questions in the, uh, the chat here that I'll take some time to answer before we pivot into the academic section, the latest one being, from the financial perspective, are you able to run payroll for your school staff? Unfortunately, no. As I mentioned before, Gradelink is an accounts receivables program and not an accounts payable service, and so we don't currently support any HR-related things like being able to track things like inventory or do payroll. It's a good question, though. There's another question, can the school nurse log when students visit the clinic? Uh, you may have mentioned, uh, noticed before in the student section when we were in the medical, there's a section for exams, and in there you are able to program in office visits. So you can specify the date and time that the student came in, uh, your findings, your treatments that you offered, any referrals that you made, so if you called mom and dad or if you had to forward them to their doctor for more professional care, anything like that, you are able to go ahead and program that in. It's a good question as well. Another question here, uh, does this work with programs like QuickBooks? It doesn't fully integrate with QuickBooks currently, though we have explored that option and we'll continue to do so moving forward, just kind of finding the best options there since QuickBooks has a large suite of different programs and options that they kind of offer to organizations that work with. But again, you can easily export information from the system into an Excel file if need be, and that can be pretty easily imported into QuickBooks. Lee has a question here, can you print out statements? Yes, right, so parents are able to download monthly statements as well. You can go ahead and as an administrator also generate those statements on a monthly basis or on a year-to-date basis and print those out or save them as PDF copies if you need to. So absolutely, you can generate statements through here. Uh, another question, uh, does this program work with a hot lunch program? Yes, and we will actually see this in a little bit here when we take a look at attendance. Seems a little odd. You probably wouldn't assume that attendance would be kind of programmed in with lunch. But Gradelink has what's called billing values, so that when you actually select that somebody gets lunch today from the attendance sheet, it'll automatically have a dollar amount associated with it that will populate a charge onto the ledger here for you automatically. So if you mark down, for example, that Susan B. Anthony got lunch, it might be a $5 charge. That $5 charge automatically shows up on here at the end of the day once you refresh the charges, and that amount can actually automatically be adjusted by the system based on whether or not you've programmed in things like free or reduced lunch plans for your students. So yes, absolutely, there is a hot lunch program. I think that addresses most of the questions that have popped up here. We're going to go ahead and transition since we're a little bit past the halfway point here for the presentation.
presentation. If you have other questions related to some of the administrative tools that we looked at today, including communication, financial, and online enrollment and registration, again, please feel free to reach out to us. I'll be sharing some information at the end of the presentation here. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and pivot here into taking a look at some actual academic tools. And this all starts with the classes section. I don't want to spend too much time here because it's really not the most exciting section ever, but it's really important to discuss this to talk about the foundational aspects of Gradelink and how we set up classes. Within Gradelink, we kind of define a class as anything substantial that a teacher is going to be interacting with to input data into on their students. So traditional things like mathematics, English, science, social studies, or history, things like that, would of course be considered classes because those are things where we're inputting grades and assignments. But you'll notice on my list on the right-hand side of classes that I've already set up, there are some things that you might not expect that are also considered classes. For example, things like attendance, behavior, narrative comments, before and after care, work habits, and even sports classes or clubs would be considered classes within Gradelink. They track different things, not necessarily grades, but they still would be considered classes. And we can determine what type of class and the parameters behind it on the left-hand side. Most of these are fairly straightforward, so I don't belabor the point too much. You can program in class names and titles, the teacher or teachers in charge of the class, the report order, so what order it shows up on, on things like report cards, transcripts, and progress reports. And also things like what type of class it is, whether it's the standard kind of graded one, or a few different options down here for things like school attendance, sports, lunch, so on. You can program in unique grade scales, so whether you're doing the traditional ABCDF model or some sort of mastery scale, like standard-based, or if you want to do a behavioral scale, like the OGSN scale, the MXT scale, you are able to do those as well. The sky's the limit. On that note, Greenlink does support standard-based grading. We're not going to have an opportunity to take a deep dive into it today just because it is such a complex and robust idea. But just so you're aware, Greenlink supports standard-based grading. It is fully integrated with our grade books, our lesson plans, and our report cards. So keep that in mind. If you're interested in learning more about that, feel free to reach out to us. You can also set up schedules within the system. We refer to these as simple schedules and what we would probably call more advanced options. Simple schedules are exactly what it sounds like. You're able to plug in the specific time and location of a class, and it's kind of understood that that is consistent throughout every day of the week. So in this particular case, we might say that this class happens period one in the same room five days a week, Monday through Friday, right? But if that's not the case, if we have a rotating schedule or if classes only happen certain days of the week or maybe the, the room number changes depending on if it's Monday or Wednesday, we can make adjustments to that either on a week A schedule or an alternating week A, B schedule. In doing so, we are able to go ahead and actually program in student schedules so we can kind of assign students to these classes and eventually we'll be able to run student schedules and teacher schedules to be able to see where they're at at any given point of the day. Parents and students can also log in on their end and click a schedule button to look at the same exact report. So they'll be able to see what their child's schedule are or if, you know, if they're just kind of starting out at the beginning of the year, they get a better understanding of what they're doing. Now, once a class has been set up, that's really the teacher's cue to log in and start manipulating things a little bit themselves. One of the first things that they might do is interact with the lesson plan section, which is an opportunity for them to come in here and program in specifically what's happening in a particular class. So in this particular case, let me kind of narrow this down to look at some lesson plans here, and we can take a deeper dive into that. This would be one week's worth of lesson plans, so week four of January, for one particular teacher, in this case, Joan of Arc. Now, everything about lesson plans can be customized by the individual instructor. The color of the classes, the order of the classes, the content of the lesson plans, these are all things that can be adjusted just by clicking the settings button at the top of the page. And you'll notice here when I click on this, I'm able to change the tab settings, so the content of the lesson plans, or I can click class settings to actually adjust things like the color. I can make adjustments to what order it shows up depending on the day of the week. I can make these different things repeat bi-weekly if I'd like to do that as well. 
So I can go ahead and make adjustments to lesson plans on an instructor-by-instructor -instructor basis. You can also go ahead and click on a lesson plan to learn a little bit more about its content. So in doing so, we're able to see things like the lesson, objectives, notes, and anything else that the instructor is programmed in. You can also tie this into assignments that you're offering as a part of the class. So if you're going to teach a lesson and then give an assignment related to that lesson, you can integrate the two. Any attachments that you want to upload as a part of the lesson plan, you can do. And again, Gradelink does support integrated standard-based learning as a part of our lesson plans as well. So you can associate standards to lessons and track as you're communicating those standards and teaching them what's been taught and what you still have left to teach. There is room for comments as well on the right-hand side. These could be comments left by the administration for the teacher. It could be the teacher leaving a note for themselves. It could be teachers working together collaboratively and leaving notifications for each other. When they first log in, there'll be a little kind of comment button that shows up right here that you can click on to see that information very quick. Lesson plans can also be saved into Gradelink. So you don't have to worry year after year about recreating these same lesson plans. You can see a lot of these are kind of busy, right? There's a lot going on here. When we take a look at this, we've got a kind of steep information as far as the lesson. The objectives down here has practice questions that I've already programmed in. I might have resources that I've linked to. This could be a lot to have to work, work through every single year. So you can actually save your lesson plans into Gradelink and pull them up again next year if you'd like to. If you forgot to save them, that's okay. They're still existing in last year. So you can go back to last year where you taught the lesson and you can save it then if you need to and pull it up later. So it's just like if you save a file onto your computer and you want to reuse it, except the Gradelink basically automatically saves the file for you in a lot of cases if you need to go back and find it. You can either sh also rather share those lesson plans with your fellow instructors. So if you want to create almost like a living library of lesson plans or even assignments, which we'll take a look at in just a second, you are able to actually not only save those collections, but share them with your fellow instructors. We want to make it easy for lesson plans to move around because the best laid traps or plans rather of mice and men often go awry, right? So in order to kind of accommodate for that, we make it so that you can easily bump your lesson plans forward, extend them into future days, or back them up a few days if you need to. If you do bump a lesson plan forward, it bumps forward all other lesson plans in equal amount of time, whereas if you extend it, it just goes into the next day without disrupting any of the other lesson plans. You can also copy and paste a lesson plan from one day to the next. You can do recurring lesson plans that happen on a particular schedule, like if you do uh, a timetable for math every single Friday, you can do that. And you can even drag and drop lesson plans. You can literally pick it up and drag it into a different day if you need to. So we want to make it as easy as possible to change lesson plans if you need to. Another thing that we want to take a look at is often the grades, right? Now we've taught. The, the students, what we were hoping to as a part of these lessons. Now let's talk a little bit about the grade sheets. If you've worked out of another SIS or grade book before, this is going to feel fairly similar. If you never have and you've worked out of Excel, this is going to feel very similar. And if you've never worked out of any of those before to handle your grading, this is still going to be very easy for you to be able to become accustomed to. The very first thing that an instructor is prompted to do when they log in and start wanting to add grades to their classes is to create what's called assignment categories. These assignment categories are exactly what you'd expect. These would be things like classwork, homework, test, participation, those sorts of things. And they're adjusted on a class-by-class, teacher-by-teacher basis. So you're able to program in the title as well as the weight percentage. If you don't want to do weight percentage, you can also weight based off of points, right? I can, instead of saying that a homework assign or homework as an, uh, an assignment category is worth 25% of the overall grade, I can simply say that a 10-point homework assignment is worth half as much as a 20-point homework assignment. Okay. If I don't want to do traditional grading at all, that's also fine. Gradelink does support objective-based grading, right? So if you don't have assignments that you give, if you don't do points, if you don't do percentages, if you just want to come in from time to time and kind of update how well a student is progressing in a particular objective, Gradelink supports that as well. You can also program in things like dropping low scores automatically, extra credits, things of that nature. 
When we're looking at an assignment, we can learn a little bit more about it. For example, the title of the assignment, the date it was assigned versus its due date, and other pieces of information like the category I was just talking about, or if there's a curve, grading style, or extra credit. As we've already discussed, GradeLink can be, uh, allows you to grade things on a percentage scale, a point-based scale, or a flat letter grade. You can program in a description, which allows you to communicate information to your families when they log into the system. There will also be hyperlinks in here to other websites if they need other resources outside of the system. You can provide them with attachments so that when they log in, they can actually download a copy of this attachment, whether it's a PDF, Word document, PowerPoint, or something other. So for example, if you're giving a test on Friday and you post to your assignment on Monday letting them know, you might upload a study guide on here so that when the family logs in, they can actually download a copy of their study guide. There's also a collection tool which we did talk about a little bit when we were discussing the lesson plan section. Right? I mentioned before that you're able to save your lesson plans into GradeLink and similarly you're able to save your assignments into the system as well, which allows you to go through and pull up those same assignments next year search for those assignments, and even share them with other members of the team if need be. Now, in order to see what it's like for a teacher to actually interact with their grades, we're going to go ahead and log in as Joan of Arc here and be able to see what it's like to enter grades in as a part of GradeLink. When we're taking a look at the grade book, you'll of course notice that every assignment at the top of the page has a grade button, whether it's been graded already or not. Whenever we click this, we can either make adjustments to our existing grades or we can add a brand new grade. So for the sake of the demonstration, we're gonna click grade on this sculpture project over on the right-hand side. This takes me to a page that has three interactable columns that we can kind of manipulate. The first one is a simple grade one. Where we're able to program in the grade that all of the students got. Let's say for the sculpture project, the most common grade everybody received was an 85. And rather than typing this in for every single student, we can click this little blue arrow icon, which actually allows me to apply that 85 to everybody. From there, I can either click through or click and click enter to go down the list here and make adjustments. The second tab that we can interact with is the grade code section. These are alternative grade codes, as we would call them, things that kind of take the place of a normal grade, like a percentage score or point value. Common ones would be things like missing, excused, incomplete, and absent. Now, these are not hardwired into the system. Administration are able to adjust this, but keep in mind that it is a school-wide setting. So for example, I'm not able to say that an M for missing in fourth grade is 0%, but an M for missing in fifth grade is excluded from the grade average. We want it to be fairly consistent so that there's no confusion for our parents. The last thing that we can program in would be narrative comments that we want to type in. These are different from our narrative comments that would show up on something like a report card, which are meant to be more longitudinal, right? We're talking about when we, we have it on a report card, it's largely about how well they did over the semester or over the trimester, over the quarter. But in this particular case, we're saying how well they did on an individual assignment. So when parents or students log in, they can take this feedback and better understand how they can improve. So for example, you might just type in great work and drop it down. But if you have comments that you use fairly regularly, you can click this manage comments button and actually program in comments that you can pull from in a comment bank. So things like excellent job, for example. Or over here for the 70, maybe assignment was incomplete. This saves me a little bit of time here and there, allows me to kind of move into the next thing fairly quickly if I need to. Once a grade is saved and submitted into the system, it updates for everybody in real time, meaning that parents, students, teachers, and admins will all be able to see that information immediately. Another important piece of information to keep in mind is that parents can sign up for alerts as well. We talked about alerts as far as the uh, discipline section was concerned, so allowing kind of parents to receive alerts based on things like behavioral incidents that have occurred or things of that nature. But parents can also receive alerts based on grades and attendance as well. So if they want to receive alerts every time their child is marked absent or tardy, if they want to receive alerts every time their child does poorly on a particular assignment or gets a bad grade overall in the class, like let's say their math grade dips below a B minus, 
Parents can actually sign themselves up for those alerts as well. And that can be customized on a class-by-class -class basis. If they know little Johnny struggles in math, but that he excels in English and in social studies and in science, they can sign up for alerts in math that are a lot more strict and stringent than they are in some of those other subjects. Now, before we talk about things like report cards and transcripts to wrap us up for the day, I do want to take a quick brief opportunity to take a look at the attendance sheets. As you might guess, we can access this by going over back here and clicking Attendance. Let me zoom in a little bit here so we can take a, a better look. Now, GrainLink allows you to track attendance in one of two ways. In this particular section that we're looking at, this would be our daily attendance. This is really where we're coming in and once a day we're kind of taking attendance. Maybe we update it as the day goes on depending on the circumstances, right? So for example, we might take attendance at the beginning of the day, but then a student leaves in the afternoon, so we need to update that. Or if a child comes in tardy, we'll take it when they come in. Right? These attendance values that you see on your screen here are not hardwired into the system. You can make adjustments to these very easily if you need to. So you can add or remove different options as you see fit. Present and absent are the only two exceptions. We find that pretty much every school, almost 100% of them, I would say, use present and absent. So you can't make changes to those, but you can add anything else that you would need. As I mentioned before when I was answering somebody's question on hot lunch tracking, I said that it was kind of related to the attendance section, which is true. You can actually see on here that some of these options over on the right-hand side, the furthest here, would be things like lunch one and lunch two. Having them in attendance does kind of this double effect, so to speak. On one hand, having them in the attendance section allows us to just do a quick report when we actually run an attendance report. So instead of saying, show me everybody who was absent uh, 10 times this month, that would be a lot of absences, 10 times this year maybe, uh, we can instead say, okay, show me everybody who got X amount of lunches over the course of the last semester. Right? Or show me how many people got lunch today specifically. What's my total count? And so I can run a quick report. But it also has the double effect of tying into the financial piece. These values are what we refer to as billing values. As I mentioned before, they have a dollar amount associated to them that automatically goes onto the financial piece and applies a charge to that account. When we were taking a look at the student section, we also talked about financial assistance codes. Students can automatically program, or rather administration, can automatically program in student data for things like free and reduced lunch plans. And the dollar amount will automatically adjust before it actually charges the family. So if lunch normally costs $5 and we marked down that Johnny got a $5 lunch, but Johnny is on a reduced or free lunch plan, it might automatically adjust to $2.50 or to $0, depending on the circumstances. Right. Now, instead of actually doing daily attendance, GradeLink also does periodic attendance or class-based attendance. These are for those instances where students are moving around throughout the course of the day. They might be in class for one hour at a time, and then they have to shift to a different teacher in a different location. GradeLink does account for both of these. So not only are you able to do daily attendance, but if you'd like to take attendance for a particular class, you can actually click on the class name and take attendance for that as well. These options can be customized by clicking the settings button in the bottom left here. There's daily attendance and class attendance settings. Clicking on this allows you to make adjustments at any time and determine things like present and absent values, whether or not it shows up on the report card, and if it associates to that billing tab that we saw before. All right, so the last major thing that we want to take some time to talk about would be reporting. One of the big things that everybody wants to use a student information system for, of course, is kind of complex internal reporting. And we've discussed a few of those options thus far. We've talked about uh, being able to run reports on enrollment applications, reports on some of the financial information. We talked about some of the student data reporting. But another big aspect of that, of course, would be some of the academic reports that we're able to run. And those can largely be accessed through our administrator and teacher report buttons on the left-hand side. The two are fairly comparable, but as you might guess, the administrators can run a lot more reports than the teachers can. So the teacher report section is just less busy than this administrator report section. 
Admin reports are where we're coming to largely run reports that are generally focused on attendance, grades, report cards, honor roll, things of that nature. Right? So I might come in here and I might run a report that says, show me everybody who has at least three absences and five tardies over the last few months. Or I might come in here and I say, okay, show me everybody who has higher than a 3.7 GPA. And I can run different kinds of reports like that. But some of the more common ones would, of course, be report cards and progress reports. Running a report card in GreenLink is really easy. At the end of each term, whether you're on a quarter system, trimester, or semester system, or some other term system entirely, at the end of each term, you'll have your teachers or your administration do what's called concluding a class. Concluding a class is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically just telling GradeLink, hey, this class is over and done with. I'm not making changes to it anymore. We're kind of finalizing it. And once a class is concluded, its data automatically goes on to things like report cards and transcripts for you. At that point, all you have to do is come in here and specify the term range, right? So wh what is the full range that you're running this report card for? Do you want it to just show quarter one and two? Or do you want it to show quarters one, two, and three with the semesters? Do you want to just do quarter three? However you want to handle it. So you select that first. You can also go ahead and program in who you're running the report card for. So whether it's a particular individual, an entire class, or an entire grade level, you can program that in. And finally, you might have what's called report card profiles. Now, not every school is going to make use of these, but a report card profile is the ability to have report cards that look generally the same, but with a few subtle changes here and there. A good example is having a report card for your upper grade levels that displays GPA, whereas your lower grade report cards might look pretty much the same, but do not show GPA on it. So we call those different kinds of profiles. I do want to show a couple of examples of report cards here, just so you guys can see what we have the access to be able to run. So bear with me, and I'll go ahead and pull those up for you real quick here. In the meantime, I'll go ahead and pull transcripts up so that we can take a look at what those would look like. Running a transcript is even easier than running a report card, because with transcripts, all we have to do is select the student's name, and it will run automatically. So for example, if I wanted to run a transcript for Susan B. Anthony, we click it and it pulls up with information immediately in real time. Transcripts have the additional benefit of not only showing longitudinally how many classes they've taken in a particular grade level up until now, but we can also track things like graduation requirements, cumulative GPA and credits, class rank, we can do weighted versus unweighted, and although it doesn't display on this particular transcript, you can also store things like test scores, as well as awards and accomplishments. Test scores might be state testing. It might also be AP tests that they've taken, their SAT or ACT scores. Awards and accomplished might be everything from perfect attendance to honor roll or something else that you want to grant them. Transcript data stores forever. So if you need to pull up a transcript from an alumni who graduated 10 years ago, you can easily do so. In fact, if you wanted to make adjustments to that transcript, you can click Edit Grades, Edit Classes, Edit Terms, or Edit Attendance at any point, and you can actually make adjustments to the transcript, even though they haven't been a student for years. For those instances where students have transferred from a different location, you can click Add Grades at the top, and you can actually add grades and classes even though they never actually took them at your school. So you can put grades and classes in from different schools, and you can give credit to them as well if you'd like to. In addition to being able to print or save transcripts as PDF files, you can also allow parents and students to download unofficial copies of their transcript. It doesn't look anything like this. They can't use it in an official capacity. But if you can imagine me just copying and pasting this data here into an email and sending it to you, that's virtually what they'll see. It's pretty comparable, right? So it does give them at least some sort of idea of what they've done, how much they've progressed, and what they have left to do at the school. With that being said, let's pivot back to report cards, and we'll take a couple of looks at some of these different options that we have, just to show you GradeLink's level of customization. Now, don't get too hung up on here as far as the overall look and feel of this report card or some of the information that's on here. GradeLink has a huge degree of customization that goes on within our report card templates, and we want to work with each and every school during the implementation phase to design their report cards, progress reports, and transcripts for them. 
So we go to great lengths to make sure that when we build something for you, it's going to be what you need. This report card would be fairly common for upper grade levels. Right? This is something that we would probably run for middle school or high school level students where we're not spending too much time on focusing on any one particular thing, whether it's grades, attendance, comments, or so on. We might also have something drastically different. This report card, for example, has now been flipped on its side. It's actually folding open down the middle. So if you're looking at this, you're looking at the inside at this point. There's a lot more space here given to each and every class to kind of focus in on some of its intricacies. We can scroll down and we can also see this nice front cover that we've crafted for the school. And on the left-hand side, you would see the back cover, which has copious amounts of room for narrative comments if we want to put those in. Like transcripts, report cards can be printed off or saved as PDF files. If you want to print them and actually mail them, Gradelink does actually generate mailing and address labels for you if need be. But unlike transcripts, which can't be directly posted online, outside of the uh, unofficial capacity, you can actually publish official report cards online, meaning that parents can log online and click a button that says download my report card onto their phone or computer, and they'll get the exact copy that we're seeing on our screen here. Not only does this save you a lot of time, and saves you a lot of paper, but you also get a report that will show you which parents have accessed the report card and which have not. So you know for a fact that they've opened it up and seen it. You don't have to worry about getting a signature back or anything like that. Now, there are a myriad of other reports that you can run within Gradelink. Unfortunately, we don't have time to take a look at every nuanced thing. Uh, again, if you take a look at the administrator or teacher reports, you'll be able to see everything from custom rosters to lesson plan reports, standards reports, being able to run reports, like I mentioned before, on things like GPA for honor roll. If you want, you could run things like enrollment or ethnicity reports. All these sorts of things would be possible, but unfortunately, we don't have too much time left here to take a look at the system. So with that being said, I wanted to thank everybody for sitting down over the course of the last hour and taking a look at Gradelink. I'm going to pull up my information here. So if you do have questions, I encourage you guys to reach out to me whenever you get a chance to and ask any questions that I did not have a chance to answer today. As I mentioned before, in addition to being able to answer any questions that you have, if you do have different users who didn't get a chance to sit down with this webinar today, let us know. We've recorded a copy of this webinar that we can share with anybody who needs it. So if you want to get a copy, feel free to email me at taylor at gradelink.com or give me a call at 1-800-742-3083. And when it prompts you to enter in an extension, you can plug in extension 120 for me directly. If you can't get through to me directly and you'd like an answer quickly by phone, you can also hit extension 1. That would be our sales team. And anybody else on the team will be able to help answer your questions too. Again, I'd like to thank you guys so much for sitting down with me today. I'm going to end the recording now. I will stay around just for a few minutes after the hour here to answer any other questions that people have via the chat. Again, if you have other direct questions you want to reach out to me, please feel free to reach out. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you guys so much again, and have a fantastic day.